This is episode seven of the Immunology Podcast, Mechanisms of Itch with Drs. Isaac Chu and Tiffane Voison. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Roud. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today we have Drs. Isaac Chu and Tiffane Voison from Harvard Medical School on the podcast to talk about their research examining the mechanisms of chronic itch. We've also got our usual round of recent highlights in immunology news coming up, but first... Stem Cell Technologies would like to introduce you to Dermal Cell News, covering everything from dermal stem cells and tissue regeneration to skin cancers and disorders. Dermal Cell News keeps readers current with the latest news, research policy events, and jobs relevant to the dermal cell community. Check out Dermal Cell News at www.dermalcellnews.com. All right. Hey, Brenda, how you going? Hey, Jason. Very well. Excited to talk about science today. Indeed. Indeed you do. Is uh, the land of pipetting still going well? Yes, it is. The lab is nice. You should try, you should try it sometime. I mean, I, I get to head into the lab here in a few weeks, actually, and I get to go play with cells again. It's very exciting. Okay, have fun. But yeah, I don't have to worry about mice breeding anymore. Someone else gets to. And that's a wonderful feeling. Well, you're moving up in the world. I'm trying, trying, one step at a time. Anyway, okay. so we should probably hop into this. I got some good papers today. Mine are pretty dense, but I'm going to try to work through them. They're pretty interesting, though. So I think I think they're worth talking about. But they'll they'll we'll try to keep it a little higher level because if we deep dive, uh, it, it's going to get hard. Anyway, to start with the first one, we got a good paper coming out of Nature Immunology, published June seventh here, called "Skin and Gut Imprinted Helper T Cell Subsets Exhibit Distinct Functional Phenotypes in Central Nervous System Autoimmunity." First author is Michael. Hiltonsberger. All right. So, Brenda, what are the three types of T cells you think of normally? Helper T cells. 1, 2, 17. Yeah, there you go. So, I got these subtypes. But as you probably know, we keep finding that there's a lot of a lot of smear between the subtypes, right? Yeah, you know, there's a TH1 that has some TH2 properties and says 17 slash 2 and 17 slash 1. And it's all it's it's all a little smushy. And so, so this paper goes and says, well, what if what primes a T cell isn't so much, you know, we, we have these 1, 2, 17 concepts, but what if it's the location where the T cell is primed that drives some of this? So, <laughs> so this paper really divides it up and looks at it, inguinal derived or gut draining mesenteric lymph node T cells. And they use a, uh, a new version of a photo inducible tracker. Uh, so you shine light on these UV light on the mice, which you can do through the tissue. And then it turns um, a protein and a mitochondria on, so it, it photoactivates it, and then it lasts for two or three days. The mitochondrial location makes it more uh, persistent and durable. And then they can see where these cells go. And so what they do is, at a high level, they photoconvert the cells at either the derived from either inguinal or gut mesenteric lymph nodes using a variety of antigens and then using a uh, central nervous system model of multiple sclerosis. Um, to, gen to show that both cells are involved in these processes, but that where you come from determines your, your cell profile. So you can find distinct populations by RNA-seq, by cell surface markers, and that the site of priming helps determine these just as much as the regular Th1 or Th2 profiling concept does. And that, that, that inguinal cells all, all aren't Th1 or Th2, but they are a unique population with a shift in how it behaves and mesenteric ones. Similarly, they have a mix of both Th1, Th2, Th17 properties, but that are distinct and you can see them be distinct by post hoc analysis even and say, oh, now if I don't know what these are, can I go in like a different system and see them split out? The answer is that they do. Um, and then interestingly, they showed that the mesenteric T cells particularly infiltrated the white matter, whereas the inguinal drive T cells were more recruited to the gray matter. And so what this is, I, I thought this paper is very interesting. There's a, there's a lot going on here, but at a very high level, it's showing that your site of origin of a T cell, which determines a lot about how the antigen is presented to it and the milieu that it's in, really sets something for life, or at least as far as they were able to detect in these cells, which was several days, the properties of that. And that even then, after they identified these populations and designed these RNA-seq fingerprints for them, you could see these populations were durable and persistent in other scenarios. And so this pattern was was universally applicable. 
as far as they could detect. So it's very fascinating. It's a lot of detailed work, but it's really showing that maybe this dichotomy of 1, 2, 17, which we know is breaking down. It's a very useful dichotomy, but like a lot of dichotomies, it's not perfect. It's showing that l location really also matters and that that may be another concept of how to, to classify a cell or especially a T helper cell. Yeah. So where you're coming from matters about where you're going. I don't know. That makes sense to me. Um, because yeah, all the, the, the milieu, as you said, the milieu in, in this different uh, sites is certainly distinct from each other. It, can you just tell me a little bit, how is the model that they, how do they, uh, activate or they how do they yeah activate these t cells in this mouse model oh there's multiple models so one of them is an ms model where they provide chemicals so eae um autoimmune mm. experimental autoimmune encephalitis so it's this mog mm -hmm. peptide mog um with a, a mycobacterium tuberculosis protein in it and you or pertussis and pertussis toxin and that mm. breaks down the barrier and causes an induced experimental model of uh ms so that's one model that's the model my the lab i did my postdoc and used as well and then they did other things where they did uh subcutaneous injections of ova um there they used lps peptidoglycan so they did a bunch of different systems as well to show that this pattern still happened this optogenetic tools are super interesting that you can use light to to follow up cells and from a particular spot. Yeah. Uh, but well, I think we can stay with the brain or stay with the in this case uh, the CNS interventions. Uh, I but I will talk about what else about COVID. Today is all about COVID. I'm sorry, but there has been a lot of interesting immunology-related COVID news in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's going to be these this two papers I'm going to talk about, and there's a couple coming that have been pre-printed in uh, the arch bioarchive that I hope we can talk about maybe once they get accepted somewhere. Uh, but today, I just want to talk to you about a paper in which they look at the, the inflammation in the brain caused by COVID, which I think is really interesting because uh, we know that COVID has uh, Im implications on the on the nervous system and on the brain, and that's really, really dangerous for, for people infected with this virus. And so I'm going to talk about this paper published in Immunities. Actually, it's been accepted. It's a preprint, so I don't know when will be officially published. Uh, but it's titled Deep Spatial Profiling of Human COVID-19 Brains reveals neuroinflammation with distinct microanatomical microglia T cell interactions. And this is from the, the labs of Marco Prince and Bertram Bench from the from Freiburg University. First authors, Marius Schwabenland and Henrique Salier. Um, and basically in this paper, what they do is they look at cross sections of brains from 25 patients that unfortunately died of COVID, and they compare them to other brains from either people that had non-COVID-related respiratory failures, uh, either also they compare with patients with multiple sclerosis, which are known to have inflammation in their brain, and also control patients. And they do a very deep dive into all of the, uh, a lot of immune markers, immune populations, and other markers in this brains by using imaging mass cytometry. Some people might know this as a the fluodyme um, platform in which you can um, stain your, your 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 slide with antibodies conjugated to heavy metals, and then you just like laser uh, one micrometer uh, micrometer um, spots in in the slide. And then you you kind of c capture the ions emitted, and then you kind of analyze them by mass cytometry, and then you get really cool uh, visual uh, analysis of your slide with tons, tons, tons and tons of of different markers. And I think the so the paper is very de detailed, but I just want to get gloss over the most important parts, and I think it's very really nice for anybody to look at it and read it if you're interested. But well, they see, and I guess it's not it's not it's not really uh, original, but they see substantial immune activation in this in this in this brain 
uh, samples, which I think we know, but they really compare it to other these other deceased uh, brains. They also they look at very with very uh, high detail, and they they have a very nice description of different clusters of cells that they find in these brains, and so they also detect the var the um, the viral antigen in ACE2 positive cells that are in the vascular compartment of the brain. So that also gives an idea of what is where the where the virus can be infecting cells in, that are mostly in the vascular vasculature of the brain. And one of the main uh, things that they observe uh, that I think is very interesting is they look at particular CD8 cells. They see a cluster of highly activated CD8 cells that. Um, that uh, are in that really together with cells from the microglia, they they generate these clusters of cells that are really associated with inflammation, with a you know the type of inflammation that COVID specifically generates. That is different to the inflammation that they observe in, for example, MS patients, uh, and that really seems to drive a lot of the pathology in the brain. They also look at other uh, cell types, for example perivascular macrophages, and they also uh, seem to really drive the, the inflammation in the brain. And I think it's very nice how they, they show a crosstalk between particular CD8s and the microglia, which are these you know, immune cells uh, in the brain, and how the, the activation at, around the, the vasculature of the brain really compromise the integrity of the vasculature and generate damages of the blood-brain barrier. Um, so I was, I was thinking a very nice uh, deep dive into how COVID is affecting the brain, how this is different to other types of damage. For, uh, for example, they look at other uh, respiratory diseases. So they try to differentiate damage that might be caused because of hypoxia. And they also compare with other typically inflamed uh, 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 brains, as I mentioned, with the C uh, with um, multiple sclerosis, and they really see a distinct, uh, distinct hallmarks of COVID infected brains. So it's a really nice, really nice paper to read, but a lot of information to 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 look at. Oh, that's interesting. So I had a couple thoughts. So one, patients that I've seen who have like brain fog and then are COVID positive do very poorly. Like they feel weak. They're having trouble thinking, well, I haven't seen many, I, a lot of them don't make it. They look okay on day one, mm -hmm. and then they're not okay really quickly thereafter. So that's really interesting. But secondly, when you talk about these deep spatial profiling, my brain immediately thinks about, uh, pun intended, um, the fact that uh, you have to take that mass spec sample, like that like one micron laser captured, mm -hmm. and that has to go in a tube. If I understand correctly, they just like laser it and they just suck up what it's been lasered out and they put it in the MS as like this whole thing. So they do the whole thing once. I'm just thinking of how many yeah, individual yeah. reads that is and the, the amount of data to spatially map it. I've seen the, the results. It's I mean, crazy. It's the number data. the number of individual yeah. data points. And that's what I was really getting about. Like so maybe, maybe they don't put it in a tube because that'd be horrible and they send it straight over, which is good. Yeah. But like the amount of data points, like every micron yes. on a slide, every part deep over a whole thing, like there's a hard like drive or five. Yeah. Hours and days. It's hours and hours and hours to, to and, be done. And hopefully the robot does it, but you know it's going to break down, which means some grad students there all day long. And so, you know, my <laughs> theme of unsung heroes here in science is that poor person who's also amazing, who's probably working this machine to keep it running, <laughs> to do one brain section. No, I cannot imagine one of hours of, of, of acquisition that this experiment uh, took. But uh, it's really nice. I mean, I think... Um, uh, uh, this 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 kind of uh, imaging mass cytometry is, is pretty pretty cool and can give you a very rich uh, data. Um, but yeah, but still a lot of work and uh, very interesting. So anybody interested in seeing what COVID does to your brain, check it out. It immun immunity soon out. This is your brain. This is your brain on COVID. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Freedom COVID. All right. All right. What else do you have for me? All right. Well. The first word of this paper is not going to startle you at all. It is microbiota. So microbiota derived acetate activates intestinal innate immunity via the TIP60 histone acyl transferase complex. 
It's an immunity. First authors, bat hyphen Erdane Jugder, uh, came out August, or uh, sorry, it's not August. It is June 8th, 2021. You can see where my brain's at today. All right. So very cool paper, very complex metabolism paper using Drosophila as a model organism. Um, I'm going to keep it real high level here because it, it's a lot, um, so what they do is they look at enterendocrine cells, which are a great cell population that's underappreciated, in the anterior midgut of the uh, Drosophila. So kind of like the small bowel-ish, if you wanted to, you know, compare it to vertebrae. And so what they show is that there's this receptor called TARG that they identify as an acetate receptor. And their caveat being that they com didn't completely show that TARG is the only acetate receptor, but they show it is one. Because if you knock it out, you can't give acetate to rescue the model, but you can give other larger um, carbon compounds like that will then be uptake converted acetate. And that gets synthesized into acetyl coenesterase through your, uh, and you know, through, and then through your mitochondria can take things like pyruvate or citrate, which also rescue this, make acetyl CoA. And that acetyl-CoA acts on TIP60, which is a histone acetylase, and modulates IMD signaling and essentially act, you know, tunes the and activates intestinal innate immunity. So you have kind of this very odd and interesting crosstalk sensed with germ-free uh, Drosophila in this case, not mice, not zebrafish, Drosophila, which you can do. You can make anything germ-free if you try hard enough. Uh, just a little gamma radiation. And so what they do is they show that A, TARG1, so T-A-R-A-G, TARAG or TARG, depending on how they make they abbreviate it, is required for these enterendocrine cell response to acetate. That the acet acetate increases the CoA pool, the acetyl-CoA pool um, in enterendocrine cells that produce, pre present tachykinin. And this modulates the activity of an acetylase and this acetylase activates downstream innate immune pathways. And so the microbiome is important because the microbiome can serve as a source of intestinal acetate. So the, the bugs make the acetate that the body uptakes, um, but it's not required. So the pathway they look at is something called PGRP-LC, but that's basically the TLR homolog of Drosophila. Um, and so they basically show that TLR signaling is activated through acetate, which is levels are derived from the microbiome. And so instead of just having your TLRs, your pattern recognition, your pattern recognition receptors going on, that your body, or, or at least Drosophila and presumably then uh, higher organisms, also sense the metabolic products of the bacteria and have secondary tuning and regulation of those pathways based on the presence of the metabolites of the bugs. So it's not just LPS signals from a bacteria signals a TLR receptor. It's that that bacteria also consumes stuff in your gut and makes metabolites and your body has a second level of tuning to respond to those metabolites and then regulate your immune system. So uh, just, just another layer of complexity in all of our complexities. And so the, it, it, it's just interesting that you can see this, this other level. And so these cells respond and produce antimicrobial peptides. They tune the level of microbiome and they can do that in part by sensing the metabolites versus, oh, there's just a ton of LPS. What do I do about it? They can actually sense the level, not just from that one receptor, but from these other pathways as well, which makes sense. You can then have, you know, differential gradients of signaling. So I thought it was interesting. I think it, it, it's a very, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting paper. It took, it took a couple of reads throughs. I'm not going to lie to try to track down everything, especially since it's Drosophila and all the acronyms are different. So you have to convert, you know, the name of the receptor to TLR every time in your head, but it was very, very mm -hmm. interesting to see this happen and how, how much work they did on it. Because I wonder whether it, it, it gives you any idea of commensal versus pathogenic bacteria, whether, you know, there's a difference. So Vibrio is an example of the pathogenic, and then the yeah. Acidobacter and Lactobacillus were examples of 
non-pathogenic right. strains, they say. But what they could right. see is there was a different tuning response. So the amount of growth of one would change the response. And so you'd, you'd have this dual layer tuning of, oh, the bugs have these receptors activating, but they also then kind of the state is also being understood by the acetate levels. Well, I guess that also in eukaryotic cells, and I'm thinking of T cells and other immune cells, the levels of acetyl-CoA also affect the acetylation of histones. And uh, so it has also been described for, for, for mammalian cells that they can respond to levels of fatty acids uh, by, by through the acetylation of their histones and through some of these, of these genetic shenanigans. So it's, I think it's very nice to see it also uh, in, this, in the case of, of this paper where they also combine it with uh, yeah, pathogen receptor like um, my pattern receptors. Um, it's nice to see uh, more of a double, so two times the information to understand your environment. So mm -hmm. I don't see this. This could very well also be the case for, for immune cells or other uh, eukaryotic cells. Yeah, and they tried to do some work with the Vibrio and see if that was affecting pathogenicity, but they found that because their tools would block the, um, basically it would alter lipid and carbohydrate storage and metabolism. And that's, mm. that's how part of this works. And so if you block that, you affect the wasting component of, it, of cholera. And so that's what they were seeing there was protection from. So you'd have less wasting if you tune down acetate because oh, right. then you're storing it, which basically, you know, acetyl-CoA is like the one block unit of fat. And so you would then yeah. let have wasting. So th th it got complicated. And so I don't think they really were able to ferret out in detail, but they were seeing mm -hmm. that they it could sense it. And at least the pathways were all modulating their responses. All right. So another way in which microbiota regulates your intestines, as if we didn't have enough. All the ways. Uh, I'm going to finish up with a short story, but very important, at least for me. Uh, I think I hadn't told you before, but two weeks ago, I was lucky enough to get my COVID vaccine. Thanks. Yeah, I only beat you by six months. Well, because you're older, you needed it more. Yeah, true. Uh, and, uh, but here, as in, I'm in the Netherlands, I got the Janssen vaccine, which uh, also known as Johnson & Johnson, but it, which is, uh, has been developed here in Leiden in, uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, the one is a one-shot vaccine. And of course, I was very happy of getting a COVID vaccine, but you know, a part of me was a little bit, you know, not a little bit unsure because most of the research that has been published, and so I've been keeping up with uh, with the current literature, has been on the mRNA vaccines, a little bit more on the AstraZeneca vaccine that have been approved a long time ago, and a lot of these really cool papers where they show the you know, the breadth of the immune response and the titers of antibodies and the T cell responses have been mostly on the mRNA vaccine. So I did not know what I was getting really because the data was kind of flimsy and yeah, the, the clinical trials for this vaccine was, were not as spectacular as for uh, the mRNA vaccines, but this has been a little bit uh, better thanks to a paper that was uh, that's also in preprint and accepted it's not preprint it's accepted preview accelerated article preview from Boston from uh, the labs of the lab of Dan Baruch and first authors are Galit Alter, Yang Yushu and uh, Yin Yang Liu and Abhishek Chandrasekhar uh, that I guess they're all first co-authors and it's titled Immunogenicity of AD26 CoV-2S Vaccine Against SARS-CoV-2 Variants in Humans, which is the, the vaccine, uh, the, the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This vaccine has, uh, as many of you know, uh, adenoviral vector, the adenovirus 26, which is also the one used for, for the first doses of the Sputnik V vaccine. Uh, but then Sputnik V has a second dose of a different adenoviral vector. Um, and this was released some later than the other vaccines and had clinical trials, was a little bit controversial because the clinical trials were not as great. The results uh, were not as great of their phase three trial. Uh, they had trials in uh, the US, in, the, in South Africa, and in Brazil. And they showed between 72 and 
of protection against moderate to severe COVID. And also there was an issue because during the trial, so of J&J vaccine, unlike the trials for, for the other ones, we were have, having this new variant swooping through the, 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 the kind of the COVID um, landscape. And there are two variants that are important for this, which were the South African variant, also known as B1351, and the Brazilian variant that is called B, uh, so it's P1 or P2, uh, that were appeared first or first seen in Brazil. And that they have this a mutation known as E484K that seems to really uh, help the virus evade previous uh, immunity against the original COVID uh, variant. And this was you know, coming from South America, I was following very, following very close the case, infamous case of the city of Manaus in Brazil that got basically COVID all over again because they got this new variant and all of the in natural immunity that people had developed on a very severe first wave, uh, it just kind of swooped through the city again, uh, also causing horrible, horrible, uh, uh, horrible spike in cases. And so there was also a lot of questions of how this other variant affected the efficacy of this clinical trial, which was used, you no, know, it was designed with a spike protein of the original COVID. And uh, given that in South Africa, 90%, 95% of the sequenced virus for COVID-19 cases were of this other variant. And in the case of Brazil, it was 69% of the new cases were of the P2 variant. Uh, so this paper looks closer into uh, the efficacy of this of this uh, vaccines against the original COVID and a couple of variants, including these two that I mentioned, and they measure uh, humoral immunity, as in um, and in the in the in the measuring by measuring uh, neutralizing antibody responses with pseudo pseudo uh, type virus. They also measured uh, cellular immune responses by ALISPOD, and they measure interferon gamma production. And they also look at the TCR repertoires and the breadth and the depth of the TCR repertoires of this of this uh, of the patients that have been um, vaccinated with, with this vaccine. And although they do observe that the titer is affected, the neutralizing titer is is uh, negatively affected uh, in the case of the other of the other variants so pseudo, pseudo uh, virus that is pseudotyped with the other spike proteins they do see a reduction in the neutralizing capacity of the serum from these people but and i think that is very nice they see basically a conservation of the t cell function uh for this uh for this uh for all of these different variants so although the tighter the antibodies are not as good, maybe at, at, at catching the virus, you still have a very robust spiked, uh, uh, spike directed uh, immune response in, in the T cells that could probably protect you from uh, the, 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 the full blown infection. And they also correlate this with the actual, the fact that although most of the people were infected in, in, in these two countries were infected with these other variants, the efficacy was still pretty good and people were very much protected against the worst of the disease. So for me, it was really nice because, you know, I have very cool data showing that what I put into my arm was probably a good idea in knowing even more data about it. I think it was, was really good. And in times like this, when we want to really utilize all of the, all of the vaccines available, this information is really, really critical to to make to know what is the efficacy and the level of protection that each of the different uh, vaccines can provide us. Yeah, so, so one T cells get the job done, as we keep saying. Yeah, I think that we I think we need to make some T shirts for that, definitely. <laughs> and then, and then two, uh, you know, don't 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 doubt Johnson. So this was this was my COVID uh, news for today, and hopefully next time I'll have some other news talking about. B cell long term B cell immunity. Hopefully, that paper will be will come up, and there's also some preprints about other stuff that are in the in the bio archive. There we go. And then, hey, we got the Delta variant eventually. Well, I'm sure we'll get to discuss that in a bit. <laughs>
Yes, definitely. A little bit about how apparently they find that new methods by which this this new variant is evading uh, innate immunity. So I'm also looking forward to talking about that paper. So I call dips on that one paper when it gets published. Exciting times for COVID research. It is, and immunology. We're going to be speaking with Drs. Isaac Chu and Tiffane Voisin from Harvard Medical School in just a moment. But before we get to that, explore scientific resources from your immunology research at the Stem Cell Technologies Immunology Learning Center. Choose from different research areas and find expert interviews, technical tips, educational webinars, instructional videos, and much more. Visit www.stemcell.com slash immunology hyphen research. Hi, everyone. Today we are joined by Professor Isaac Chiu, who is an assistant professor of immunology at Harvard Medical School, and uh, Tiffany Voisson, who's a former postdoc at the Chiu lab. And they're going to talk to us today about a very exciting area, which is neuroimmunology. And basically, what is the role of nervous system uh, in mediating inflammation and host defense and how these two systems interact with each other? Uh, Tiffane is the first author of a recently p- published paper in PNAS, and she's also going to talk about that today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's our pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Glad to have you. So as I just said, it's very exciting, the work that you do, and this, this latest paper that you published, which uh, uh, looks at the at the relationship between neuronal uh, stimulation and itch and how the immune system is related to to this. I, I'm very excited to talk about it today. And but I would want to ask you first if you could share a little bit with the audience more about the topic of neuroimmunology because I think for many it's still not very known. And maybe you can touch upon. How has the understanding of neuroimmunology and the influence of immune cells, in particular, maybe the sensation of pain and itch has evolved, especially, I guess, the last few years? Sure. I think it's, like you said, a very exciting area, which is neuroimmunology. That's growing in uh, importance. I think that immunologists are starting to appreciate that nervous system actively participates in regulating the immune system and vice versa. Neuroscientists are appreciating that there's intimate crosstalk between immune cells and neurons in different neurological conditions. In this case, we're talking about pain and itch, which are sensations that we experience, uh, we've all experienced unpleasant sensations. Pain uh, causes us to withdraw from a um, noxious stimuli and itch is also in a, in a way for, for an unpleasant sensation that causes us to scratch uh, and to remove threats from our skin. But it turns out that these sensations are also triggered often by um, the immune system at these barrier sites like the skin or the gut. Uh, and at these barrier sites, we know that both the nervous system and the immune system, are their, their major role is to detect um, potential stimuli at these barriers, and also to potentially um, protect us from these uh, threats. So it's, it makes sense that these two systems are intimately cross-talking with each other. Um, and we know that uh, from experience that uh, pain and itch are associated with inflammation, right? So inflammation, this uh, term that talks about how, um, you know, when we have uh, injury or when we have infection or when we have uh, autoimmunity, uh, we have these sensations. And it's increasingly clear there are molecular mechanisms by which these nerves are detecting factors from the immune system. And so there's a lot of excitement to define how um, these two systems crosstalk so that we can better treat pain and itch and also maybe also target neurons to treat inflammation. So that's even more uh, kind of a concept that immunologists are starting to appreciate, that nerves can powerfully regulate innate and adaptive immune cells at these barriers in, in, in uh, chronic inflammatory diseases. Yeah, so to, to jump in on this a little bit, a chunk of my grad work was actually on the role of opioids in inflammation. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to kind of the larger world of all these uh, G, G protein coupled receptors and other receptors that seem to either classically exist on nerves, but also exist in immune cells like opioid receptors or vice versa. What, what that, that milieu looks like, uh, 
at the immune cell neuron interface and what happens. Like the example I think of is that your microbiome status affects your pain response, or if your toe's inflamed and then you hit it with a hammer, it hurts more, which is hyperalgesia. But, you know, I have only thought about it in that one mic microscopic area of interest and, you know, bringing an itch and all these other things. I'm wondering if there's a patterns that have emerged in the field that you could speak to that seem to be like larger themes that we're just starting to understand. So thank you um, for that question, Jason. I think that's an excellent question. So uh, evolutionarily, we know that these two systems have co-evolved. And um, I, I was mentioning earlier that, you know, both systems are there primed to detect dangers. And so it, even in early um, uh, organisms like C. elegans, there's this idea that the nervous system can detect pathogens or detect bacteria, harmful bacteria, and allow avoidance of that bacteria. And I think we as immunologists may not appreciate that neurons, there's specialized neurons called nociceptors, which um, have a lot of the same ways of detecting uh, pathogens that immune cells do. So they express toll-like receptors, they express um, uh, formal peptide receptors and other receptors on their surface to detect potential harmful microbes. And that signals pain but also these neurons then signal to the immune system through neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. You mentioned opioid receptors. So that's an uh, interesting parallel system where you see opioid receptors both on neurons and immune cells. And actually immune cells also express opioids. So that allows kind of, that's a dampening of the pain signal, right? So you, there are other examples where um, there are shared, uh, uh, receptors in both systems, I'm thinking about, for example, cytokines. So there are cytokine receptors on neurons that powerfully induce pain and itch. So for example, type 2 cytokines like IL-13 and IL-14 or IL-31, which comes from Th2 cells, they're, they're, the nerves um, detect these cytokines and then they produce itch. Whereas by contrast, uh, IL-1 or IL-17 which are associated more with kind of painful type of diseases like autoimmune diseases, you activate pain fibers, right? So the same set of cytokine receptors you might think about in the immune system to direct one type of immune response or the other, type one or type two, is actually coupled to different sensory neurons to produce hyperalgesia, like you mentioned, pain responses or itch responses. So it's really fascinating the parallels between these two systems. Um, and I think another really exciting thing is to realize that almost every immune cell has receptors for neurotransmitters. So pain fibers and itch fibers, they actually express neuropeptides. Um, one example is CGRP and substance P. So these are uh, released from these nerve terminals when they're activated. And T cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, mast cells, they have receptors for these neuro neuropeptides. And so this allows the coupling of pain and itch to inducing the immune activation, uh, innate immunity or adaptive immunity. It is fascinating how close the relationship is. Uh, it really shows how these two systems co-evolved with each other and the amount of mediators uh, between these two cell types is, is quite, yeah, it's quite fascinating. And I know that you have uh, work also on a different type of mediator, which are lipid mediators, and I really want to go to that. But first, I just want, want to have one more general question. Uh, and I don't know if either of you would like to respond. Um, I'm very interested in knowing, for example, I, the gut is also very uh, innervated with, with, with uh, neurons and with uh, very, has a very elaborate immune immune pattern, immune system. And I wonder what can you tell us about the importance of this crosstalk in the case of the gut? Yeah, so I can answer that question. And so th there's really exciting work, of course, uh, ongoing on how the gut, gut and the gut microbiome and gut immune system crosstalks with the brain. And there are sensory nerves from the vagus uh, that directly connects the upper gut to the brainstem. And then there are dorsal ganglia, which we study that connect the lower GI tract to the spinal cord. And each of these types of nerves 
um, will signal circuits that induce things like visceral pain, satiety, um, nausea. You know, there are key um, uh, modulators of this gut-brain axis that then feeds into, um, you know, potentially whole organismic states that relate to brain um, states like depression or anxiety, um, stress. So trying to understand the neural circuitry that innervates the gut, uh, that crosstalks and the molecules from the immune system and the microbiome that, that activates these neurons or shuts them down is, is really going to be an important area of research in the future. And I think uh, we have found, for example, that pain sensing neurons that innervate the gut regulate the microbiome. And this is important to protect the home, to protect the gut from incoming pathogens like salmonella. Um, we have, we and others have also found that the gut epithelial cells that lined um, the colon or small intestine are regulated by the nervous system. And um, things like antimicrobial peptides, as well as the micro, like I said, the microbiome is actually um, regulated by the nervous system. And so it's a bi-directional crosstalk where the microbiome produces factors uh, which can activate these neurons or silence them. Um, and also uh, the neurons regulate the microbiome. So it's just a very important area of research and exciting area of research. I think understanding it could lead to new treatments for neurological conditions uh, like pain, neurodegeneration, and depression. But interestingly, uh, to, to make a segue here into some of the more uh, work you've done recently, uh, I wanted to uh, bring up the arachidonic, ac arachidonic acid pathways. So I think the most classic one are the, the COX inhibitors, prostaglandins, and then the corresponding COX inhibitors. We think of like aspirin, ibuprofen. I think, we, I think it's well established and people kind of know this instinctively if you're inflamed, as I talked about earlier, you have higher pain sensation in that tissue and people can take you know, ibuprofen is a simple example, and that reduces the inflammation and reduces the pain signaling there. But I hadn't thought, and probably I should have, about the uh, the parallels that go on with other similar uh, molecules like the leukotrienes. And so I wanted you to kind of use this as a springboard to talk about your, your more recent re work linking leukotrienes and itch and this network as well, linking the immune system and the nervous system. So I don't know if you want to start with that and uh, kind of describe some of this recent work that really dived into this. Sure. So I'll start by saying I am not Im an immunologist. I am an, I have a neuroscience background. So uh, I came at it from a slightly different angle. And it was based on um, Isaac's work previously. We did an analysis of the sensory neurons. Um, and so the one that innervates uh, most of the body that comes from the dorsal ganglions and they are very diverse and uh, they are very complex um, categorization that were done before either by function by expression of certain markers but it was kind of messy and they're very different so uh, he did and many people did at the same time transcriptomic uh, analysis of those neurons to be able to get a clearer picture of exactly as they were and what subset existed. And from that analysis, uh, we found this very interesting subset of um, sensory neurons that uh, we thought were each neuron based on the, what, the different um, transcripts that they expressed, including, uh, as I has mentioned, the RCT1 receptor. RCT1 is a cytokine that we know induces itch. Um, and there was also the neuropeptide NPPB, which is also in, uh, involved in itch. And those markers were exclusively expressed in this subset, not in other neurons, and they were highly expressed in the subset. So that in itself was very interesting because a lot of the receptors were receptors for um, immune med uh, mediators from immune cells. But also we found there the receptor for uh, the cystinocotrine and the receptor CCLT2, which at this point had not been described in sensory neurons. So just the fact that it was expressed on sensory neurons was very interesting, but that it was specifically expressed in this each subset of neurons um, made us think that it could have a specific role there. And especially because the cystinocotrines, uh, which, as you said, come from the... Um, 
downstream of the arachidonic acid pathway uh, and get released during inflammation um, by cells that express the um, so downstream of the arachidonic acid, the LTC4 synthase. So specific cells only can express the cisneucotrienes. And um, at the time we started, it was mostly known to be um, in allergic type of diseases like uh, asthma, for example. And most of what was known, so for the cisneucotriene, I should say, there are three different uh, cisneucotriene, LTC4, LTD4 and LTE4, and they are very fast mediators that get converted into one of uh, one another, and the LTE4 is the final metabolite, and they have three different receptors with kind of different affinities, and only the CCLT1, which has a good antagonist, was well known, and that's the one that was known to be involved in the asthma type of uh, diseases. The CCLT2 receptor, which we found in the sensory neurons, was not as well characterized, uh, and what it was doing on the sensory neurons was completely unknown. Um, the one thing we knew from a previous study was that in a model of um, it, mouse model of atopic dermatitis, it was involved in the skin thickening and the collagen deposition. But at the time of that study, um, uh, they didn't look at itch at all. So taking all of that together, the fact that the receptor was so highly expressed in those sensory neurons that were seemingly dedicated to itch and that that receptor was involved in a type of skin disease that was um, a topic. We, we went with the hypothesis that the CCLT2 receptor could be an itch receptor in that, in that context. So that's that was the basis for the study. And um, so we confirmed the expression of the receptor in the DRG neuron from the mice. We also got uh, some help from Ted Price from the University of Dallas. And very nicely, he was able to show that it is also expressed in sensory neurons from humans. Um, the one interesting thing about that is that the, the proportion of neurons expressing the CCLT2 receptor is highly different. In the mouse, you have our, around 10% of the neurons total that express the receptor, whereas in humans, it's close to 60%. So it indicates that the roles that we find in mice uh, might be different, or there might be some other roles in humans that we don't know yet. But that was very exciting when we got that result. Um, and from then on, we um, were able to show that by injecting the leukotrienes directly in the cheek of the mice. So I should maybe uh, mention the, the couple of models that we were using to study each in mice. Uh, we have the acute um, uh, portion of the assays where we just inject whatever ligands we're looking into, and then we just we count the number of um, bouts of scratching that the, that induces in mice. Um, we can also uh, score it, like the time the mouse spent scratching. Um, the, we got a nice setup to do this, where it was we put the mice in this infrared box, and then we could leave the room. The mice were nice and um, on their own in the dark because uh, behavior is uh, is very finicky. You can have a lot of things that interfere with the uh, with the results. So having the mice by themselves without me looking at them mostly that was um and we could record it and watch it afterwards and do multiple type of analysis from the videos um but basically what we were able to find with that setup is that um from the system uh ltc4 which is the first one in the cascade was able to induce scratching but not the ltd4 the lte4 uh, that are downstream of it and we kind of confirm it using um a version of LTC4 that does, does not get, get converted. So that was interesting in itself that within the family, only the LTC4 was able to induce um, scratching. And we were able to characterize the scratching. Um, it has some in interesting properties that were different from uh, each induced by histamine, each, uh, each induced by other chloroquine, which is another subset, subset of each neurons. So we were able to do that nicely and uh, we then confirmed that I was dependent on the CCLT2 receptor using knockout mice. So we use a global uh, knockout mice for the CCLT2 receptor in which we didn't see the itch induced by the leukotrienes or the LTC4. And we also had, so we didn't have a conditional, because 
the C32 receptor is not exclusively expressed on neurons, it's actually expressed on the numbers of immune cells. So we always had the concern that what we were seeing was not dependent on the neurons, but could be from other um, indirect effect on the neurons. So to kind of get around that, we first excluded the mast cells. We use a, a knockout strain of mast cell, and we didn't see any um, decrease in the in the scratching. So we excluded the mast cell as the source of this the indirect source for the, the scratching. And we also did some bone marrow um, chimera where we uh, transferred wild type bone marrow into knockout mice and vice versa. And in the end, we needed like the cells that were uh, bone resistant to the to the radiation that were C32. Uh, um, basically, it indicated that the most likely it was the neurons that were um, with the C32 that one is necessary for the scratching. And with all of that, so we had like this nice signal that we were acutely provoking. Then we wanted to know uh, if we could find a system or a model where we saw a role for the whole pathway. And this is where we went into models of chronic itch that exist. And because also what interested us in uh, the chronic itch um, is something that is uh, kind of very common and not very easily treated. So it's, there's a huge interest into understanding how that works uh, on top of just the acute um, settings. So we tried a different models and in one that is very, um, it's induced by, it's called the MC903 model. It's this vitamin D analog that when you apply it on the skin of the mouse, it induces huge inflammation that can be characterized somehow as TH2 um, inflammation, even though that can be discussed. But it recapitulates some of the um, properties of atopic dermatitis in mice. So we thought that was a good model. And what we saw when we did this, we did this over a period of 12 days where we did daily application. And we saw that, so it induced a huge swelling of the skin, uh, huge inflammation, and the mice start scratching quite a lot spontaneously. And what we were able to measure during this model that is used across the itch field is that the um, cystinocotrine levels were going up. And especially by the end of the model, by day 10, day 12, we had like the highest level of cystinocotrines. And using mass spec, we were able to determine that it was mostly LTC4, so the first one, and also the LT LTE4, which is the final metabolite that we were expecting, but not so much the LTD4. And so that was at the 12th of the, the last day, and that tell, told us that the production of the LTC4 is ongoing, because otherwise it would get converted. So just the fact that we were seeing the LTC4, we had a huge um, production of LTC4 then. And then we did the behavior analysis, and we saw that in the C32 knockout mice, uh, the, during the first phase of the model, there was not that many difference. So there was no significant difference between the wild type and the knockout, but at day 12, we had like half of the scratching was gone from the C32 knockout mice. So that made, made us think, and our conclusion from all of this is that we think the nucleotide pathway kind of ramps up and by the 12, this is where you have the highest production. This is where it starts to actually have an effect on um, the neurons and to provoke, to induce scratching, which is very interesting because you have other studies that find some other, um, I'm thinking of Diana Batista, she showed that the neutrophils come in earlier and have an effect. So we think that in this model in particular, you have phases and different um, uh, immune cells and immune product come in and add on to the to the scratching phenotype. So it's clearly um, a mix of things that happen and knowing exactly who does what at which time I think would be very important that we were able to show the, the at least the involvement of the, the system of the pathway. And what was interesting, we tried other models that didn't have that inflammation um, aspect to it, we did a dry skin model, and we did not find um, an effect of the cystinocotrine, like the, the knockout didn't have any diminution, uh, decrease in the scratching. So 
it seems specific to models that are this huge inflammation component. So the, at the end, we were able to yeah show this uh, involvement of the cytokine pathway in this chronic itch model. One quick question: mm -hmm. in this, in your model, so you say you couldn't pinpoint which are the cells that are responding to this inflammation and producing the LTC4. It's still a, yeah, a question that we haven't answered. We uh, excluded in that model the mast cells. We also tried mm -hmm. the, knockout, the knockout strain of mast cells and it didn't have an effect, like the scratching was, uh, was the same. So there are a couple of uh, candidates for this in the model of atopic dermatitis uh, used by the, for the earlier study that I mentioned. The LTC4 was coming from isinophils, so that's mm. a strong candidate. And there's a recent paper by Brian Kim using the MC903 model, but with flare-ups. So it's a different, it's a modified model, but they find a role for basophils producing the cystinocotrines in flare-ups during the chronic itch. So it's, it's a very interesting study. So it could be coming from different, um, different immune cells, and that will be something very interesting to, to get at. Fascinating. There's so many ways of having itches. Um, yes. Isaac, uh, I just wanted to, to ask you, how, how have you developed kind of this research line? And I see now you're working, for example, with neurobiologists. Your, your own um, studies are more immunology-based. How, how did you find yourself in this field of study? Well, that's a great question. I, I think I'm a hybrid and a lot of neuroimmunologists. Tepen here is a neurobiologist by training, but she's learned a lot of immunology and I'm the opposite. I, I started in immunology and I learned some neuroscience. And I think that's like the breaking of the borders between these fields is exciting. So I get to interface with neuroscientists who study pain and itch. And, and you know, I think they benefit from interfacing with immunologists because as you can tell, you need a deep understanding of both topics. Um, so uh, I'm excited about it. I think there's still a lot to uh, understand, like what Tiffen just mentioned, what are the cells that make these leukotrienes? Um, she mentioned eosinophils and basophils, which are in themselves, I think, less well understood types of immune cells, but they are part of the allergic response. And this sort of pathway that caused um, activation of neurons through cis LTs could be even broader than just itch. One of the things that could be interesting is because we find, actually Tefen has found, for example, that um, these neurons that express it are also innervating, for example, the gut or the lungs. So could it be like in other allergic conditions like asthma or food allergies, maybe, you know, parallel pathways are happening in, in, in neurons, other types of neurons. So it could be a fundamental pathway for how neurons sense in, uh, type two inflammation. And I think to the point that um, was asked earlier about prostaglandins and pain, I think this is a really interesting point about lipid mediators that you have, we know that arachidonic acid um, re, you know, metabolism results in leukotrienes on one side or prostaglandins on the other side. and we know from the sensory nature of pain and itch are actually quite distinct, right? Pain is, in fact, pain is thought to inhibit itch, right? So when you scratch, you scratch until you feel pain. So there are inhibitory circuits from the pain neurons that inhibits itch and spinal cord. So they're quite distinct. And it could be that they are coupled to different types of inflammation, right? So if type two inflammation results in cis LTs, leukotrienes, and activates itch fibers, whereas type one inflammation or other types results in prostaglandins causing pain fiber activation. The logic to it could be really interesting. I mean, to me, it's logical that you would have distinct types of sensory functions in different situations. And part of it, just to step back for a moment, is you know, itch is a desire to remove large things like threats like that. You know, for Scratching and allergies make sense, whereas pain maybe is more coupled to wound healing, right? And and so I think, I think, um, I think this pathway that Tefen discovered um, involved in, in in neural activation is 
could be very fundamental to the type 2 immune response or type 2 neural response. <laughs> As a follow-up then, and uh, maybe this is getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I don't know, are you guys planning on making some of those sexy mice like you know diphtheria toxin depleting acenophils or uh, basophils and then shoving them full of leukotrienes and see if they itch or not or you know reinducing your response what have you and trying to see if you know you can you can find that cell so you had the mast cell knockout but uh it sounds like you have to you know mm. do the good old-fashioned i need to make 10 mice and figure out which one's right uh, <laughs> a scenario so i don't know if you guys have started to go down that course or if there's a better way even maybe than a lot of mouse breeding which is the default yeah, I think there's uh, a lot of interesting um, questions that can be done on the immunology and neuroscience side. We haven't done what you were talking about, targeting each of those exact immune, uh, immune cell types, but actually uh, on the neuron side, Tefen actually uh, generated a Cree mouse for the CIS-LT2 receptor. And the idea would be maybe we could use optogenetics or chemogenetics, which are neuroscience tools to specifically activate the nerves to see what happens. And I think it would be interesting if we can get that to work to see what happens to the immune response in the skin or in these other tissues. And also, of course, whether itch is produced. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of what neuroimmunology is like. We manipulate one system and see what happens in the other system. <laughs> and I think there's a lot to do in both directions. Um, yeah, so I think basophils, eosinophils would be great to target. Another cell type that's of interest recently for um, for uh, neuroimmunology is dendritic cells. So there's a lot of interactions recently shown in the skin between uh, dermal dendritic cells and and Langerhans cells with these nerves. So I wonder if like those kind of cells are also sources of leukotrienes, and also if their uh, crosstalk is involved in itch. Given all the weirdness I've seen in biology, I wouldn't be surprised if dendritic cells are secretly some type of half neuro neuronal cell or something that we just don't understand because they look <laughs> like nerves. And like every other time biology plays this trick on us, that, oh, it looks like it. it also does that thing too. Ha, 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 ha. And then you're like, you're scratching your head 20 years later. But I, I just, you know, the, the, the paranoid, like it always happens over and over again in me thinks that, you know, dendritic cells could be secretly hiding something. Yeah. They're always hiding something. They're always hiding. <laughs> well, they're a favorite cell type of many immunologists. I, I do want to highlight the mast cell. I know that we didn't see a phenotype there, but I think mass in terms of this model, but mast cells and nerves have long been thought to play a very intimate role. Um, so they are, they're juxtaposed to each other in many tissues in the skin and the gut. And, and, um, if you activate nerves, the mast cells would degranulate. So there's a really intimate communication between these two two cell types. Um, so other that's why we targeted them, you know, from right right from the get go is because other mast cell mediators like histamine, tryptases, um, a lot of the like serotonin, these are really well known itch modulators. And talking about itch modulators. Uh, so chronic or acute itch is actually very severe for a lot of people and treatments are always welcome. And you actually touch upon potential treatments uh, by targeting this, this new novel pathway you described. Maybe do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think so. The, the leukotriene pathway in general has been of interest uh, in, in atopic dermatitis and other um, pathology where you have chronic itch, but kind of singling out the actual mediator that have been a bit difficult. So there have been some broad just uh, antagonists for the whole pathway. I'm thinking of the flap inhibitor that has been tried, but with some mixed results at some point. And also the CSRT1, this other receptor antagonist has been tried and also is, I think, very mixed results. So targeting the CSRT2 receptor specifically, I think, could be something to try. And it might be in combination with other uh, drugs might be not the be-all and all of uh, strategy, but it could be something that helps maybe in certain conditions or at, at certain times during the, the pathology that could, that could help. Yeah, so I can add to that. I think chronic itch is a major cause of suffering in, in patients with many uh, diseases, including atopic dermatitis and idiopathic you know, puritis. There's 
people who really suffer, they have no options because antihistamines actually only work for things like hives. They really don't do much for um, patients with uh, chronic itch diseases. So identifying these sort of non-histaminergic pathways to produce itch, that produce itch and blocking them could be exciting. Uh, Tefen mentioned there's already treatments for asthma based on cis-LT1 receptor, which is the, like the drug Singulair. Uh, but cis-LT2, the one that we found on neurons, so far there's no yet drug in the clinic that specifically blocks that one, although there are antagonists uh, that are experimental. So it would be exciting if this could be in the arsenal of um, you know, drugs that could target um, certain forms of itch. And I think one of the key questions would be defining in humans, you know, whether this pathway and which types of pathways are involved in different types of uh, inflammatory itch. So you can think like besides atopic dermatitis, which is a big part, there's also contact dermatitis and there's, um, you know, people who have, uh, you know, other forms of, uh, you know, itch, so like if I mentioned dry skin itch, these are all problems for a lot of people and defining the, the different molecules involved could lead to new treatments. So to follow up there, maybe I, I, maybe you can't talk about it, but are you guys looking at say monoclonal antibodies to the cis TR, T, cis LT2 receptor, you know, go straight to the biologics, make an antibody to a G protein receptor that's on the surface and inhibit the sucker. That's a great idea. Uh, and it's not something we're not doing that, but I think that would be a great <laughs> solution. Uh, we know in other cases of neuro science, uh, another molecule we work on uh, related to pain is CGRP, which there have been very successful antagonists against the, both the receptor and the molecule itself. I, I, I think it would be a great idea to target CISLT2 as well in the same way, you know, make antibodies or small molecule antagonists. Right. I mean, that, that's where my brain goes, especially since you're, you're not trying to go in the cell like the Cox pathways, but you're hanging out on the on the outside of the cell, you, you, you open up yourself to all the drugs that drug companies like to make these days. Um, and so, you know, you should start talking to people. All right. So I guess the, the last part we like to do is ask a, a couple of questions for you guys on more of the fun side of, of, uh, science and life and the adventures that lead people here. Um, so I think Brenda, you're going to go up to bat first and you fire away and then I'll go after you. Yeah, for sure. Um, hi, Sag. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what is a hobby that you always wanted to pursue, but well, because you have committed to science uh, and being a scientist, you didn't have time to, or you have never been able to, would you like to share us that with us? Sure. I, I love um, reading uh, fiction novels, especially mysteries. And I would love to have written one myself, be a, you know, I like Agatha Christie, that kind of thing. But if I could, if I had the different, you know, if I had time, I would write a novel and maybe incorporate some of the science, you know, like I, I love like kind of putting, reading ones that incorporate real science in there and maybe even immunology would be, I rarely see immunology highlighted in fiction. So that would be an interesting combination. Well, maybe there's after, an opportunity there. <laughs> yeah, after this year in particular, you get all types of immunology in your fiction. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> For sure. Tiffane, um, for you, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given, professional or not? Mm. Um, I remember this, this wasn't directed at me, but it was someone talking about science and it was uh, saying to remember to have fun with it. Like we get to do this very cool thing. Like we ask questions, we get to like, come up with very fun, innovative ways to answer this question and the sky's the limit kind of thing. So sometimes you can, when things are not working, you can forget, but it is fun and you should have fun doing it. So that was a great piece of advice that I, I took. Well, excellent. All right. Well, any uh, final words from either of you on things that uh, you wanted to share final wisdom before we call it a day here? Sure. Um, I think neuroimmunology is a very cool up and coming field. And I think immunologists, graduate students and postdocs who are listening to this, you know, learn about the nervous system. It's in every 
tissue, every organ that you study. And I think the nerves are talking to your immune cells of interest. And I think um, it's a frontier in science. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. See you next time.